We live in an age of profound political disruption. People around the world are hungry for change. A new generation of leaders from across the political spectrum is tearing up the old playbook. On trade, on immigration, on regulation. At the same time, technology is rewriting the playbook, disrupting supply chains, disrupting the idea of currency, disrupting how global business gets done. These technologies are reshaping the economy before our eyes. These changes are opening new horizons. The companies that harness the next wave of innovation will grow faster. They'll help millions of people lead longer, healthier, more productive lives. But the combination of technology and politics is creating new challenges. Threats to the stability and integrity of elections. Threats to privacy. Threats from state-sponsored hackers armed with weapons-grade code. To deal with these challenges, some countries are building walls, not just physical ones, digital ones that control the flow of information across their borders. In a world where access to entire markets can change with the flick of a switch, choosing the right partner to manage and secure your data has never been more important. Oracle was built for this. Moving to Oracle Cloud means you don't need to patch and maintain dozens of legacy systems to protect your data. It means you don't need to worry that you'll be cut off from your most important customers. Oracle can move your business where it needs to be. And it can do it more efficiently, more securely, and at a lower cost than most companies can do it themselves. It's a new way of thinking in an age where disruption is the only constant. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Hurd. All right. Good morning. Good to see everybody, particularly this early on a uh, Tuesday morning. Yeah, great. So we're going to try and get a lot done uh, in a relatively short period of time, provided I can execute in the time windows that, uh, that I've given. And let me try to put in context what we're going to try and cover. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the political and information technology industries or the political environment in the information technology industry and where that intersects. And we'll have a, a guest that'll talk about that sort of in the big picture, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the acceleration of the cloud. I think that's a, I don't want to say an old topic, but I think there's so much evidence now, but I'm going to capsulize it for you to show you just the acceleration of cloud adoption and do it for you you know, based on, based on numbers. Then talk a little bit about what's next. You know, given that we've been through a lot of the beginnings of this transformation of the cloud, what happens next? Then we'll get joined by some real customers, as opposed to hearing it from me, uh, hear it from folks that are really doing work in companies uh, and how they're applying technology. And we'll, we'll, we'll have a mix of customers, both of incredible scale and also those that in some cases are just born in the cloud, started out in the cloud, uh, really had no legacy environment, so hear from a mix of, of, of what you would, might think of as mid-market, uh, newer generation companies, and also companies that are going through a major transformation. And then I'll have some new predictions. What I am going to do in the middle of this is show you some of the old predictions, and, and I, I think you'll find it interesting relative to what's transpired. So that's what I'm going to try to get done in the next hour. We'll see how well I do. The bad thing about this, bad thing or good thing is, there's going to be a lot of people coming up in a few videos, and so this is uh, not the easiest thing. Uh, in addition, Dorian, I'm glad you're here. This is our chief legal counsel. She's here to make sure I, I don't do anything wrong, um, which is added pressure. Um, so I'm going to try and get all this done and get it done right in a one-hour time frame. Okay, here we go. First. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the first uh, uh, visitor that's going to join with us via satellite, and his name is, is Ian Bremer. I was going to read Ian's bio uh, for you, but instead of doing that, I don't think it does him justice. Uh, I've known Ian for a while, and Ian is probably, I, I don't know if probably is even the right word, the premier political scientist in the world uh, today. If you want to hear about what's going on uh, across the globe, Ian can take you on a, unfortunately, we, I could talk to him for five hours, 
Um, he can take you through around the globe in a relatively short period of time what's going on in the geopolitical environment. I think even more impressively, he can intersect that into what's really happening in the technology industry. And trust me, this is a real treat and a pleasure that we get Ian to join us today. So Ian, are you there? No pressure, Mark. Yeah, no pressure on me <laughs> at all. Good to see you. I mean everything I said. And so Ian, first, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, big group here, um, treat to have you. And, and I thought we might start by doing what you do so well. Take us on a quick, uh, visit around the big picture of what's going on in geopolitics today. Well, you know, we're living in a world where the economy, fortunately, is doing pretty well, both here in the United States and globally, expecting almost 4% global growth this year, next year. But the geopolitics don't feel good. And I think there are two reasons for that. Uh, the first is the top down, that you have countries like China, soon to be the world's largest economy, that are not aligned with the United States, either politically or economically, in what they're trying to accomplish in their big values and their priorities. They're building alternative architecture. They're not trying to be a part of US-led global systems. And at the same time, in most of the world's democracies, wealthy democracies especially, you have large numbers of people in those countries that increasingly feel like the system doesn't work for them, it's rigged against them. Some of that is economic, it's you know flat wages for working and middle class, even with unemployment in the US right now quite low. Some of it is a reaction to immigration and changing demographics. Some of it is a reaction to wars that haven't gone well, Afghanistan, Iraq, the US and its allies. And a big piece of it, is social media and the fragmentation inside our societies uh, of people that aren't talking to each other. And that's really a last five year phenomenon as opposed to a last 30 years for the other factors. But when you put those things together, you get a more divided US, a more divided Europe and a transatlantic relationship that seems weaker at the same time as Xi Jinping in China has consolidated power and is by far the strongest Chinese leader they've had since Mao. So I think for those reasons, the geopolitics feel pretty uncertain and volatile, even though when we think about where the economy is going for global business, we feel pretty good right now. Yeah. So you, Ted, uh, you made about a thousand points in about two and a half minutes. Uh, so let me just let me just pick on one. You you introduce the idea of China as the biggest economy in the world. I think to most of the people in this audience, that would be like, what are you talking about? Last time I looked, the U.S. economy was almost twice the size of the Chinese economy, measured in raw GDP. Uh, can you make a couple comments about when you think that might actually happen? Yeah, I think the expectation is in the next decade, uh, but m perhaps more importantly than that is the footprint of the Chinese economy. Um, because when, when the Chinese uh, engage with you in terms of trade, engage with another country, it's the government. And it's the Chinese government that's sending, that's ensuring that if tourists do or don't come, they make the decision. It's if, if big companies are going to invest from China, they're aligned with the Chinese government, infrastructure, you name it. Where if the United States goes in, the government's quite separate from the corporations. And by the way, that's the way we like the system here. But it does mean that if you're a foreign leader, you're ne the necessity of you to listen to Beijing, to Chinese leaders and do what they want or else actually has significant more impact on you than if the same conversation comes from an American president, Republican or Democrat. So the Chinese are, I think, already an economic superpower and you see that playing out in the way they've been able to influence other countries around the world. And Mark, they're also a technology superpower and that's new. And certainly when you think about AI, um, and the, uh, the, the emerging landscape in the world. You've got top companies in the United States and the private sector. You have top companies in China that are aligned with the government. Nobody else playing close to that level ball. That's gonna be a game changer in the way we think about a global free market. At the risk of staying on China too much, let's talk a little bit about though, their five-year plan, uh, their latest five-year plan, their desire to be self-sufficient, the implications on tech. By the way, you make a point that I'd love you to share with the group about China's investment in defense relative to its investments in other things like tech. Maybe you could talk about you know, the US's investments in physical assets. I, I think that would be fascinating for the, for the audience to hear. Well, uh, you know, obviously when you have President Trump come out yesterday and say, look, I'm not a globalist, I'm a nationalist, and I want to invest in America first, 
there's been a lot of talk about you know investing in coal, investing in manufacturing, getting jobs back to the United States. And, and that's a message that certainly resonates with a lot of people out there working in middle classes. Uh, at the same time, the Chinese are investing in AI, and they're investing in AI as the most important strategic sector. They're investing in technology. They're investing in semiconductors because they know they have a big gap um, with the West there. And, and when you think about the 21st century economy, um, being able to make those tech companies the most strategic is important. So I think about the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And in the 70s and 80s, you had companies that, like Lockheed and Raytheon and Northrop that were seen as the most strategic for the United States because if they somehow went bankrupt, we would be vulnerable against the Soviets. In fact, the first time the term too big to fail was ever used was in the 70s, not to describe a bank, but describe Lockheed. And you know, today I would argue that companies like you know Microsoft and Facebook and Yahoo and Oracle um, are really strategically critical to the future of the United States. But the U.S. government isn't thinking about it that way. Not the Democrats, not the Republicans. Where in China, they truly are investing into national monopolies in the technology space both domestically in China and also as a go out strategy around the world. And if you combine that with the one belt, one road plan of China, where they're spending massive money on infrastructure around the world, including digital infrastructure, the one belt, one road plan is seven times the size of the Marshall Plan right. that the U.S. spent to rebuild Europe, right. inflation adjusted. Right. And there's no one in the U.S. that's talking about writing checks of that magnitude outside. So we can complain about it. But if you're a leader of another government around the world and you're saying, well, I can take Chinese money and there'll be all these strings attached or I cannot take any money, they're going to take Beijing money. Yeah, maybe we can bring it around because we could we, there's many things we don't have time to talk about today. But talk a little bit about the intersection of I.T., uh, security, cyber and all of this and how the geopolitical framework intersects with that I.T., with that I.T., if you will, that IT industry and go forward strategy? I, I think there are two big things to focus on here. The first is that the, the global market is going to fragment into two as a consequence. But if the Chinese are going to build their own model, their own internet, if companies like Facebook and Google are not going to be a part of that, then those standards are not going to be, they're gonna be very different from the standards that we have in the US that the Europeans are not gonna be able to do a third way. They'll have to choose and they'll end up choosing the United States. So will the Japanese. But a lot of emerging markets around the world who really need that Beijing money will end up being more aligned with China. That's a completely way of thinking about the global marketplace than the US led globalization where everyone's a customer, governments aren't as important. We just need to understand market share and size. And that's coming relatively soon, like next five or 10 years. Second point is the ability of the Americans to come up to with effective deterrence against IP theft, against cyber attacks, clearly is something we have not figured out yet. And if you look at the Russian attacks against Ukraine, the not Petya attacks, as they're called, where 10% of all of Ukraine's computers were destroyed, country of 50 million people, but also big companies like Maersk um, and FedEx you know, we're suffering hundreds of millions, some billions of dollars of damage because of knock on implications of their computers that were infected in Ukraine and then hit the rest of the world. So much more investment needs to occur from Western corporations into, you know, resilience, defense against these measures that, that governments, even the U.S. government with all of our capabilities, will not be able to effectively address. Yeah. And we're, we're pressed for time. I, I would be remiss if I, with all of the news in the Middle East, and while we've talked a lot about China, a lot about IT, any, any thoughts about the implication of all that's happened in the Middle East over the past couple weeks that you'd wanna give 50 words or, or less about? On the Saudi side in yeah. particular? Well, I was trying to be a yeah. little bit politically delicate, but yeah, sure. Look, um, you know, we've got the Davos and the desert is going on right now. And while most of the Western CEOs chose not to go, they all uh, decided to send number twos or number threes. So it's not as if people don't want to do business with Saudi Arabia anymore. 
I think the U.S. alliance with Saudi Arabia will stay intact, even if there are some sanctions. The same thing will be true with the Europeans that do a lot of business with Saudi Arabia, um, the U.K. in particular, France as well. Uh, but Mohammed bin Salman, for all of his, the crown prince, he's not a political reformer. He doesn't handle criticism well. I think we see that very obviously. But he has been a serious social reformer, an economic reformer, a religious reformer. And, and the, the backlash he is now going to get in his own country from a lot of hardliners that have not wanted to see those reforms, that backlash will grow. He's weaker now. And so I do think that the Saudi investment climate is going to get more challenging going forward because people aren't going to believe in these audacious reforms that even as an authoritarian government, he was trying to pursue. And in that regard, this journalist that's been dominating um, the headlines for the last two and a half weeks, Mr. Khashoggi, uh, does have a more significant impact for the investment climate, both in Saudi Arabia and the region. Ian, thank you. Thank you so much for joining. It's a real treat. Please give Ian a hand. Thank you. Great. I mean, and I could talk to him for all day. He's uh, just brilliant. Um, let, let's just sort of capsulize a little bit. There's a bunch of stuff that I would love to have gotten to, but uh, frankly, time just, just limits us. You know, one of the core points I think that, that Ian would make if we had more time is data itself, information, uh, is a key asset for businesses to own, analyze, and have, and frankly, to Ian's point, secure. Uh, to Larry's keynote yesterday, um, virtually everybody he would think um, uh, a value that could be attacked has been attacked with, with, with some success. Um, we didn't cover it in this conversation, but, but Ian would tell you while countries like the United States invest in physical assets, we spend $700 billion in, in defense. Uh, aircraft carriers cost, you know, two, three trillion dollars uh, to, to build. Uh, a cyber platoon uh, probably costs you a few million dollars. So virtual assets, virtual resources, much more inexpensive than physical resources, and that's what's being deployed in many of these, these new economies. Cyber teams, frankly, are the new, uh, the new future. And as, as, as cloud and integrated technologies like AI, they're gonna help, and we're gonna talk about this, lower costs, drive more innovation, improving productivity. To be honest with you, the good news is all of that. Bad news is actually that information becomes yet incrementally more valuable as we do some of these new things that we're gonna talk about this morning. Okay. Let's, uh, let's shift on and let's go to the next chart. I want to do a quick look back and talk about predictions we made three years ago. So you see on this chart, I did not doctor this chart. J just to be clear, I didn't doctor it, nor did any handlers doctor this chart. So this is predictions made in 2015. Mo this chart was 15. And I, I'm not going to read all of the, well, I'll just hit on a couple of them. I have to put these on. So 80% of production apps will be in the cloud. Okay, just, just remember that. I'm not asking you to make a, a reaction to it. Just, 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 just remember that. Two SaaS suite providers will have 80% of the market. Let's see, pick a couple others. 80% of IT budgets will spend on cloud services. Uh, enterprise clouds will be the most secure place for IT processing. Again, I just read uh, a few to you. By the way, as I delivered these uh, predictions, I got, I thought, unfair criticism um, for these predictions because they were just nutty and didn't make sense. Okay, next chart. So a few more predictions. These are two years later, 2017. More than 50% of all enterprise data will be managed autonomously and will be more secure. 90% uh, of applications will, will feature integrated IA capab uh, AI capabilities, et cetera. You can read the rest of these. Okay, so let's go to the next chart. I thought I would show you what some analysts are saying, and not only notice what they say, but notice the time frame they set it. So in 15 months, 80% of all IT budgets will be committed to cloud apps and solutions. This is uh, from Forbes, very good. I could have told you this two years before that. 80% of enterprises will have shut down their data centers by 2025. This is from Gartner, uh, 2018. This is incredible insight. This is, uh, 
and I love, by the way, I love Gartner. Please don't, don't overreact. Uh, the cloud will be your most secure place for data, 2017. Oh, this is great. Uh, Oracle, Salesforce, Microsoft together will have 70% share of all SaaS revenue. This will again morph again. I could have actually, I can actually give you the answer. This is Forrester, but okay. Uh, AI will be in almost every new software product by 2020. Now, if you ever wonder the value of coming to open world, I've advanced all of this three years for you. So you would not have to subscribe to any of this. You could just take my predictions and know. So when you see me make new predictions, you now have, you know now they're credible. Maybe, <laughs> may, maybe not. By the way, this is also, I have, I have members of the Oracle staff here. So you guys should realize the insight I give you guys on a daily basis when you see, you guys feel that way? Yeah, uh-huh, okay, very good. Uh, tremendous head nodding in the, in the front rows here. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's keep pressing on. All right, so I think that the one thing you take, all jokes aside, is I don't think there's much of a debate that the cloud market is, is accelerating. Um, it's moving faster than predicted. If anything I did, what you, what you would see from some of those predictions from other people is some of them were in earlier timeframes in 2025. You saw a couple 2020s, a couple 2022s uh, in that data, and I think that's right. I think that's right. What you see now, for example, just last year alone, 15% of the U.S. corporate-owned data centers uh, shut down. 15% fewer just in one year. And if you run that out and said it was just linear, then the prediction I made of 2025 would be off by something like three, even four years uh, in terms of the speed by which this happens. So, so cloud is, is, is accelerating. Of course, those data centers, to the point we've been making yesterday, they're, they're shifting from companies and shifting to the core uh, cloud providers uh, in the marketplace. So it's not like data center space is literally declining. It's just shifting from, from corporations to, to the big providers. Cloud is core and it's foundational to modern business. So I thought I'd touch a little bit on what's next. So it, by no means is this cloud transformation, you're gonna hear this from customers. Many customers are embarking on their transformation. They're partially through it, midway through it. Um, and I don't wanna diminim or minimize the amount of work still to get done, because there's a lot of work still to get done. But that said, you're gonna start seeing a next generation of technology capabilities. So why don't we go to the next chart? Uh, and that really is gonna be driven by AI. Now just to be clear, we, we don't see AI as a, an independent solution, and there are many vendors that do. You see them out there uh, talking and making advertisements, AI in the sky is the way to go. We, we see AI as a core feature that will get embedded into virtually every solution, every application. It'll have two major impacts, and this chart is meant to, to show both of those. Productivity on one side, innovation on the other side. The fact that automation will, will reduce the time to do tasks that are just impossible to do by humans today. The fact is whether you're looking at information on employees, customers, whatever it may be, the amount of information and amount of data that companies have is beyond the ability for even the most sophisticated data scientists to take advantage of. Not true of machine learning. The opportunity to turn all of that data, all of that information into knowledge. The be able to turn that into information that helps you sell more, the information that helps you save more will affect, and AI will affect both. In fact, let's go to the next chart and talk about, as opposed to generic words, some real use cases. And I, I just admit, this is just a smattering of examples of outcomes that change as you start to integrate machine learning into real applications. So again, think of it not as a solution, but now embedded in something like an ERP cloud. 30% of finance organizations' time of our customers are spent moving around spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, moving spreadsheets from one department to another, trying to reconcile spreadsheets, and using AI, those reports become virtually error-free and insightful, and the work goes away. The work goes away allowing people to focus on higher order tasks. 35% of a, of a recruiter's day is spent on sourcing and processing candidates. Candidates to be recruited and hired. I mean, I could go farther with that object I think when a recruiter interviews somebody, the ability to know whether, frankly, a GPA matters, whether a major matters, 
whether your extracurricular activities in school matters, and talking about how these recruiters look. The fact is, you know, we've all hired from all of our companies hundreds and if not thousands of people that we have an immense array of information on that would lead us, not perfect, but would lead us certainly in the direction of the people most likely to succeed as we recruit them. And yet it's very difficult to harness all of that data information. Not true when AI is applied. Supply chain, just simply is something is, look, 65% of managers spend their time manually tracking the shipment of goods. We all see this in B2C environments as well as anything. You know, just when you think about the implementation of blockchain, which again, I don't look at blockchain as a solution. I don't think there's gonna be a blockchain ink. Uh, I think blockchain is a feature of virtually all applications that, that, that will make sense for it to be applied into for the exchange of secure information. And think about that productivity just in supply chain alone. If you don't know at the call center, when, when you call a call center, most calls are designed to last about three minutes and almost all the time is spent gathering information about all of you. Hard to know who's calling, what they're calling about, and then if you know what they're calling about, how do I prescribe a way through that that gives the most optimal conclusion? 60% of time is spent today doing all of that manual work as opposed to trying to be proactive and solving your problem. Frankly, almost all that goes away with AI and machine learning. So I, I only bring that up as a few business outcomes of the tremendous increase in both productivity on one side, saving money, innovation on the other side, opportunity for new processes uh, supported by AI, by AI that's going to occur as we start to see digital assistants um, be integrated, chatbots being integrated with all of these applications that's occurring as we speak. All right, next, uh, next chart. So um, essential insights, all the predictions, I, maybe all, true might be a little bit um, strong. I might have been a, a little bit slow as it turns out as opposed to aggressive, but predictions were true. Customers are using cloud and technology and now you're gonna see a new era as we integrate AI into basically all of our applications uh, as we move forward. Okay. Let's, let's shift a bit. Let's go to the, 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 next, the next piece. We're gonna start hearing from, from customers. And so what I thought I'd do is we'll do a mix of videos and uh, people live uh, here. And so with that, why don't we um, start with the first video where we hear from uh, a couple of customers. I've done a lot of acquisitions over the last 10 years. We are using a lot of systems that were built for a different time when we were a different business. We will go live with a full financial suite and a full supply chain suite of applications in the cloud. We actually wanted to start moving with Oracle Transportation first. It's already allowed us to consolidate freight across multiple of our business units. I think at the end of the day, the biggest thing is the ability to look at the organization more broadly as opposed to the siloed way that we see them today allows us better visibility to suppliers, better visibility to our customers, all of which have the ability to help drive cost out and ultimately help the bottom line. Finance is perfectly positioned to drive digital transformation. I absolutely believe that a big piece of finance of the future is going to be moving to more of that strategist role. Stitch Fix is a San Francisco-based company that's transforming the retail experience for our clients through a combination of data science and one-to-one -one personalization. The early foresight that the management team at Stitch Fix had to begin with a cloud-first strategy has really put us in a solid position for growth and scalability. I think where a lot of companies come in that are weighed down by legacy systems and processes, we're able to leapfrog. And not just leapfrog once, but leapfrog twice because we have the support of partners like Oracle to make sure that they are doing everything they can to advance the technology so we can focus on the growth and scale of our business. We want to take the opportunity, use the tools, the technology to automate the mundane and create the space for our human talent to be business strategists. 
So when you kind of put a high performer on a strategy project and you've unlocked some of those capabilities and they start to feel and understand how powerful that feels to really help contribute to the business as a strategist and as a business partner and a driver of performance versus just delivering the what happened versus the what could happen. My goal is let's close the books in one day so that we can use every other day in that month to deliver value to the organization in new ways that are completely untapped right now. Pretty good to close the books in one day. First, <laughs> um, thanks to the wonderful company and thanks to, uh, to Stitch Fix for doing that. That was, uh, that was great. All right, we're, jo uh, we're joined on stage by uh, Sherry Aholm from Cummins. Sherry, welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for, for, for doing this. So, can we give Sherry a hand? So, may maybe we start talking about Cummins. Cummins is uh, a hundred year old company. Uh, we talked about that. I asked earlier whether that was a good yes. thing or a, a, a bad thing. Um, a lot has changed from a regulatory perspective, alternative <clears throat> fuels, you've got new competitors, you've obviously got a big position in China, as uh, Ian was talking about China. Um, how's the company changed? Um, what impact has that had on IT? Great, I, great question. First of all, love the picture. That is actually one of our, um, our prototype electric vehicles, power vehicles that we actually have. So awesome picture, that's our EOS vehicle. So love it, we unveiled that in uh, Columbus, Indiana. How much might one of those cost? Uh, I don't actually know the answer to that. So, <laughs> but I'm sure I could get you one if you wanted one. Yeah, I could yeah. drive around the neighborhood. I'd probably, probably crazy. I'm sure I could work on something there. Uh, so I think, What's been fascinating is many people think of Cummins as a large industrial manufacturer who makes big engines uh, and, of course, power generation units. So Oracle's one of our customers that we actually sell gensets to. But more importantly, what's happening is in the environment that's going on is we as a company care very deeply about what's happening in the regulatory and the environmental side as well, which maybe some people might think is odd for a, a fossil fuel diesel generation uh, company. On the other hand, though, we pay very close attention to what's going on in the, in the market. And regulations that are coming out about how to deal with emissions, particularly we're seeing a lot of advancement on this in China right now, where China's actually moved up considerably in the past two years, their requirements on emissions are actually driving us to think very differently. California is a state that actually, even here in California, any of the ports, like the port in LA, has moved to not allowing fossil fuel vehicles into those locations. And we're also seeing the same thing happen in Europe, too. If you look at Paris, for example, they're beginning to look at putting uh, regulation in that will not allow fossil fuel vehicles into Paris. So we're, as a 100-year-old company, we want to be here for the next 100 years. So it would be naive for us to say, we're going to stand on our laurels and just be a diesel-powered you know, powered organization. So this is why you probably have seen a lot of the announcements we've been making lately about our investments, certainly on the electrified power space that we're into, um, and our work um, in the uh, municipalities with bus, you know, commercial bus, and putting in electrified power. We're also doing some other testing with alternative power sources uh, as well. But what's fascinating on doing this is moving into this space has actually created some very unique opportunities for us as a company. And it's not just about us being a very heavy duty manufacturing, industrial manufacturing, it's actually moved us into different places from a customer experience. And so when you look at that vehicle that's up there, or some of the other vehicles that we're into uh, in actually doing the commercial vans that you'll see out there, like the Perlator, UPS, FedEx vans that are out there. What we have now are seeing with people is the environment and the ecosystems that they used to have to actually manage fossil fuel vehicles are not applicable to what you need when you're running an electrified power space. And so customers are working with us now saying it's not just about selling us an electric vehicle, it's actually about changing and helping them understand what the ecosystem around that vehicle needs to be when it's in the environment with them. So what's fascinating is we're using data now off of these vehicles to help us tell those end customers how to more optimally route 
vehicles, how to help them understand driver behaving patterns on those vehicles. So from an IT side, it shifted from us being just a manufacturer with you know, an organization of lots of engineers into where IT has become a very pivotal part of the company and somewhat of the game changer stuff that we're starting to get into. Right. Right. Sherry, how, how are we doing for you in terms of our yeah. the applications uh, that you certainly are a big user of? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So one of the things that you know, I care deeply about is when I joined the company, obviously we're a huge ERP uh, environment, Oracle ERP. We have over 80 manufacturing plants around the world. One of the key things that I care deeply about is as we're going through this change about how data is so important and the way we use data to change the end experience for our customers, we need to rely on those ERP systems. So for us, I want the ERP, the HRM systems uh, to work on a day in and day out basis, and I need them to be reliable. They need to be low cost, and they need to be always on the current version. And in our world, that's where we've taken on a lot of focus now of moving to the cloud solutions that Oracle has on our HRM, we're now in the path of experimenting what do we want to do for the uh, uh, finance. And then we're also beginning to think, what do we do on the ERP? Because the ERP has probably been a little bit harder one having so many manufacturing facilities. But why Oracle's so important to us is I need those systems to work day in and day out so I can move my resources over to working on what's starting to happen on this transformation for us as a company about how to use data and change the end customer experience. Sure, how, how important is it to you that those applications don't, aren't only great applications as applications, but they work together as a, as a suite of applications? Uh, and that's critical, because you had some of that up there about the importance of AI and reducing that interface. The integration of those suites is really critical because it reduces the handoff and the interfacing that you have to do from a human touch perspective for us. So that's table stakes. As I told our board earlier this year, if I can't rely on the core infrastructure systems that run the company on a day in and day out basis to perform and be there, uh, I can't invest in the new capabilities we need to do. And we use data out of those core systems to help us make decisions. So we're already using some of the information we do pulling off the vehicle around quality to help us understand quality, but I want to use that information to actually change what's happening on the manufacturing line. Right, right. By the way, Cummins, um, while well, Sherry's leading IT, so the, the, the CEO of Cummins is extremely, uh, there isn't a deal we haven't <laughs> done where Tom and I haven't, haven't talked about what, what's going on, what we're doing together. Uh, so you've got the, the, the blessing, I'll, I'll use it as a positive, of a very engaged well, We're CEO. coming back in February probably to talk to you again, so It'll be very get exciting. ready. That'll be very exciting. <laughs> uh, so what, why don't we close up, what, what, what's next uh, in IT for Cummins? Uh, where do you see this headed given everything that we've talked about? Yeah, uh, so I want to add just one other part for you to realize that, that I think is important. As a 100-year-old company, one of the things that we have is many of our products, unlike many other companies that I work with, stay in market for a long time. Believe it or not, we have engines in the environment that are 50 years old. And we still do service and support on those engines. One of the things that we're in the middle of working with you on now is actually moving the application support that we do. All those engines actually have software on them that we use to help understand uh, customization for the customers around fuel economy, for example. We have several, you know, several, probably about 50 different servers that we're working on in a server farm right now to finish out closing out a data center we're on right now to shut down our data center in, in Columbus, where we're moving what are engineering applications that are running many old versions of Unix and Linux on them into that environment. So this is pivotal to us. We were talking about it last night because our engineers won't upgrade those environments because of those 50-year-old engines that are out in the field. Yeah. They need those old versions. Yeah. So critically important for us to have. To wrap it up where we're heading next, I think we see the value out of data and we see the value out of cloud and the emergence of how we have those combinations to give us speed 
because as a manufacturing company, things historically for us would take years to get into market. This has moved us into a place where we can actually begin to move products into market way faster than a traditional manufacturing approach would. I'll, I'll end with anything more you need from us. What do, you, what do you need from us over the next several years to help you? We need to continue on that journey of getting ERP is probably our biggest one that we need major help on right. to keep focused on actually doing that. And I want to capitalize on the AI capabilities uh, to drive more self-service across the organization and, and eliminate some of what I think are some of the lower value jobs to move people to the higher value work. Yeah. Sherry, thanks so much. You bet. 100-year-old, very innovative company, Cummins Engine. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to have, we're going to see a couple of, uh, of, at least one other video here now from Ocean X. So let's, uh, let's listen to Ocean X. FedEx has got a massive global network. Our physical network touches 210 countries around the world and 98% of the world's GDP. But one of the most interesting things is there's a digital network that mirrors that. Everything that we do in the physical world, we have a digital twin that we keep track of in our systems to make sure that we know where those packages are. But what brought us here won't get us where we need to be. The dominant design has changed and you need to focus and push ahead to a dominant design set of technologies. And in today's world, that's all cloud. At the end of the day, everything really comes back to people, whether it's our team or the teams that we tap into in our critical partnerships that we have with companies like Oracle. Our relationship with Oracle is probably at an all-time high right now. We've been strategic partners in focusing on how to make this transformation a reality how to bring new capabilities in software and infrastructure and technology, and doing that through a lens of cooperation and collaboration. Look, it's important to understand that transformation can't wait. It's a critical initiative that you have to embark on, and it's gonna take great partners to get you there. You can't go it alone. If you want to deliver the speed to value, reliability, and security that your business needs, Start and start now. It's time to move. Most businesses are about products, but we're in the business of inspiring people. OceanX at heart is a subscription platform that enables CPGs and entrepreneurs to sell direct to consumer at their doorstep with a personalized experience. We have an end-to-end -end platform from e-commerce, fulfillment, customer care, and data and analytics. Storytelling is a big part of what we do. We inspire you to try another size, another flavor, another texture that needs a lot of data. Hence Oracle, we're building databases. We know a lot about a person. We migrated the OceanX data and analytics platform of AWS into the Oracle Cloud infrastructure and Oracle's Exadata Cloud services. We gained a 30% improvement in our total cost of ownership and we gained a 3x performance improvement. What this allows for the OceanX data and analytics teams are that they can focus on what is important for the platform rather than administering and maintaining the systems. So what's next? Using databases uh, more intensively, there will be more AI used in the future. So we're combining external data, artificial data, and human interaction. That, with the autonomous engine that Oracle is going to be providing for us in the future, the list is endless for us. We're in the business of creating these forever memberships. Why I feel good going to Oracle? As far as I'm concerned, Oracle Cloud infrastructure has been a perfect run for us. Transition, perfect. We get more agility and we get lower cost, and um, that's important to me. Well, thank you. First, you probably noticed that OceanX wasn't the first video. It was actually from FedEx. Uh, that was Rob Carter, who's uh, uh, basically COO of FedEx, a great partner of ours. I blame all of that, my, my lack of introducing that properly, on the handlers who <laughs> changed, uh, changed the video order on me without my knowledge, so uh, it's not my fault. Okay. Just remember those predictions. I was right on those predictions. Um, so thank you to FedEx. Thank you to OceanX. Uh, Devendra, uh, thank you for joining us. Please welcome Devendra. He is from Tetration, which is now part of Cisco. Um, 
And so I thought maybe we'd start, Navindra, you just telling us, what is Tetration? What does Tetration do? Tetration is a cybersecurity play. We protect workloads and data in the cloud or on-premise. We watch all process activity inside these workloads. Workloads could be VMs, could be containers, could be bare metals, and even mainframes. So we watch which process calls which system calls. We look at all that information, which files did it access, what network activity was being done, take metadata out of that, stream it towards our analytics engine inside uh, uh, running on OCI in a SaaS environment. And then we actually use our innovative AI algorithms on top of it in real time, turn around, detect anomalies, detect uh, breaches or anything of that sort, and then push enforcement rules straight to protect the workload. There's a great talk today at lunch right here, which will go deep into this whole topic around titration. Oh, this is great. You turned it into advertising. Yes. No, that's Thank excellent. you. Uh, so now I know when, when, um, when Cisco bought you, Chuck was all excited. I remember him telling me about it. And your growth has been... I'm going to give you another chance for a commercial. I mean, tell me about the growth of Tetration. Yes. We're growing about 200% quarter over quarter in SaaS. So but but that like, year over year, that's yes. quarter over quarter. quarter over quarter. That's a good number. Yes, absolutely. Do you guys hear that in the so, front couple rows? Yes. Sorry, sorry go ahead. Yes. I'm just a, so it's sorry. a great platform, and we're like really passionate about this whole technology. And all those predictions you have, like AI really needs to be close to where the data is. I truly believe in that. Well, thank you. That's yes. so kind of thank you. Uh, OK, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what got us together yeah, in great. terms of titration. And you mentioned OCI and yes. now getting the workloads on OCI. Yes. So uh, we always wanted to go on SaaS. So we first started off with the two largest public uh, cloud providers. We're still on them. Uh, but the problem challenge that we were facing there was our cost structures were very high. Why were our cost structures high? Because we were getting about 5 to 10% CPU utilization on these uh, clouds, mostly because we were blocked on I.O., trying to access the data, all this ingest coming in. Uh, reasons for that, again, a bit more technical, is uh, we, weren't, we don't control, control placement of our VMs and these uh, large cloud providers, so we could have noisy neighbors. We could be placed uh, on places where the data is not locally resident. It's located somewhere else. There's uh, traversal through the network, and so on and so forth. So long story short, uh, OCI came along. We thought, OK, let's explore this. And we ported our software on top of OCI. And once we started running it, like, I was like first surprised. I asked my engineering team, like uh, the guys working with me, are we running all our tests right? Because we were seeing 75% utilization and 60 times. It's not like 60%, it's 60 times. That's 6,000% performance improvements over standard uh, our other cloud offerings, which we had. So then we actually uh, consolidated ourselves on top of OCI and uh, passed these cost savings on to our customers. And it also gave us new opportunities, business opportunities, because now we could start selling our software to small, medium businesses, commercial businesses, where we, the cost structures were too high for them in, with the previous model. So it actually opened up a whole bunch of opportunities for us. So things have changed. Oh, absolutely, right. yes. So to the benefit. Um, what, so what are the important things when you talked about, you know, quote unquote, other cloud providers, uh, very thoughtful, I yes. thought the way you did that. Uh, when, you, when you look at those other cloud providers and you look at, at OCI, what's important in terms of differentiation? You mentioned cost yes. uh, as one. Anything else that, that... There were other things like uh, we don't have noisy neighbors in OCI. We haven't experienced it yet uh, because we essentially take the whole bare metal offering and put our own image on top of it. And we orchestrate every VM and container right in our offering and keep things co-resident with each other. So we can guarantee SLAs to our customers. In this whole security business, like, just think of it like if uh, we go and tell our customers, oops, we couldn't prevent that breach because we had a noisy neighbor, it doesn't fly. Th that's an SLA you can't stand behind for your customers, and this is why really OCI helped it. You use noisy neighbor multiple times. Maybe explain to the audience what a, a noisy neighbor uh, yes. is in a, in a cloud environment. So say I'm a tenant running on uh, the shared infrastructure from a cloud provider. Uh, the cloud provider tries to pack as many assets on top of the same physical fabric or computers, and a new tenant comes in. 
he, he's placed right next to you on the same bare metal, and see he starts bursting. His VM starts bursting, my VM starts suffering performance uh, congestions and things like that. That's an example of noisy neighbors. So a neighbor comes up, it's just as in an apartment complex, someone comes, has a party, turns up the volume, and like you can't sleep because, uh, and you can't get to your meeting next day or something like that. So Thank you, very clear. I mean, that is, yeah, it's a term used, uh, you know, you hear single tenant, multi-tenant, multi, again, these in the apartment example, uh, when you get too many tenants, you can get more noise, and so therefore the noisy neighbor uh, analogy. Okay, thank you. What's, what's next for Tetration? What's, what's the exciting things on the horizon, and how can we, Oracle, be helpful to you? So the biggest thing for us right now is grow our scale, bring in more and more revenue, so that's all standard. How fast standard. is your scale growing? Okay. Just to give the people an example of the amount of workloads you're now, you're now plowing onto OCI. Each of our clusters are about 36 physical machines with 1.8 petabytes of data that get ingested, and there are 40 such clusters ingesting data across different sites all across the whole world, and like we're just ramping up on these uh, clusters. So, so a lot of stuff. A lot of yeah. metal, yes, yes. Yeah. A lot of stuff. Yep, and the, uh, where we could use help is like go to market, go jointly, start selling to our combined customers, and that would be really, really great. So that's. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. I just feel like I've, I'm sort of on the wrong end of all of this. Yeah, it's been great, great advertising. Thank that you. you. Asked me for a give. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. Anything else, Navinder? As we close up, any other any other selling you want to do while you're up here on the stage? Okay. I'll actually return the favor to you. Like uh, the OCI team, I have to uh, say this very honestly, has been phenomenal. Uh, they like a startup inside a big company. When we first started up with the OCI, like if I, this is a real true anecdote. Uh, we brought up our instance in OCI and went production within two months. From the start of writing software, porting it over onto OCI, and going live was two months. Uh, that was, I give two reasons for that. One is the close uh, cooperation and uh, interactions we, with, we had with the engineering team at Oracle. Uh, we were embedded with them, they were embedded with uh, us. 24 hour t cycles for new features or bug fixes or enhancements. Worst case was about a week, but we really got this all done. And the other thing was our software stack was a bit uh, more modular and abstracted. So those were two reasons why we really got this off. So it was really a pleasant surprise working with the OCI team. Thank you guys, wherever you are. And I'm writing down go to market help. Yes. So I've got Thank that you. Done. Navindra, you've been fantastic. Yes, Thank you. Thank so you, sir. Please give Navindra a hand. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to. Um, uh, turn to another one more uh, customer, which is CERN, and uh, let's uh, roll the video from CERN. There are four missions of CERN. The first one, of course, is to do research to understand the mystery of our universe. For supporting this research, needs technology, accelerator technologies, detector technologies, and information technology. Because of the extreme needs of the physicists doing the research, we also need to have extreme IT to support all different aspects of IT, from storage to network to database and other technologies. Remember, an accelerator is not something off the shelf. It's really a prototype that you have to be operating 24 by 7. Data has to be available for control and analysis of the accelerator. If we don't have this data, the accelerator would just stop. It would be very difficult to implement those systems without tools and database like the one provided by Oracle Corporation. Uh, we speak about performance, which is very difficult to achieve uh, using other systems. We've been working on cloud computing for a few years. We've been investigating various usage of cloud computing, but in particular for scientific workloads, which is quite different than what other people have been doing. As a very specific example on the use of cloud computing, we've been experimenting towards the end of last year at integrating a capacity of about 10,000 core on the Oracle Cloud, which has been used by the Alice experiment with success. The other thing which is very important is to have systems that people will spend the smallest time to administer. They have to concentrate on their core task, which is not to deal with database management system. It is to deal with accelerator, understanding and tuning accelerators. 
Within the context of the CERN Open Lab, we are exploring the use of the Oracle Autonomous Data Warehouse Cloud. We are hoping to achieve significant performance improvements using this technology. Having a strong partnership with Oracle is very important. We hit sometimes limits that our partner, Oracle in this case, is helping us to overcome. Oracle technologies have been core to CERN business since 1982, a long time ago, in many different areas, control system, engineering data, administrative systems. Over time, we've adopted the evolving technologies provided by Oracle Corporation to our entire satisfaction. All right, thank you to uh to CERN. Uh, I'm joined on the stage by Thaddeus Arroyo. Thaddeus is CEO of AT&T Business. Thanks for joining us. Um, I was thinking about it. How long ago did we probably, 13, 14 years ago probably? At least, been? at least, right. Yeah. Back when but I was still CIO. Us, uh, you were yeah. CIO at Singular. That's right. Back in Atlanta years and years ago. Right. And Thaddeus right. has really risen up through the ranks of AT&T to frankly be one of the most uh, senior people in the entire company. And I thought, Maybe Thaddeus, you'd start by just talking to us about uh, the new AT&T. AT&T's been in the news uh, sure. in a big way over the past uh, couple of years, and you tell us what the company's focused on today. Sure, maybe I'll provide a fine point as well as what we do at AT&T Business, and, and also was something Mark and I always talk a lot about, and how after so many years, neither one of us has aged a bit, <laughs> and so uh, the, uh, and hopefully we'll continue right. with that with Thank our you, future Thaddeus. success. Yes, but, nice uh, uh, but no, uh, AT&T is obviously evolving into a modern media company, and, and you know, we sit here at, at a unique juncture you know, we've been connecting people and businesses to their world for many years, but now we're making this evolution of not only connecting people uh, to their world, connecting businesses to their world in a new way, but how do we tap into, you know, many of the evolutionary trends that are connecting around us, and in a modern media company now, deliver a set of experiences on top of that. Um, a set of modern entertainment experiences as we marry together premier content now with great network experience in terms of how we deliver that. But we do the same thing now when you look at you know, what we do for businesses and, and the evolution now of what it means for us to serve a business as they move and tap into these modern digital ecosystems, much of what we're talking about today. So when I look at AT&T Business, you know, we serve... We serve three million customers today across 200 countries. We're a company on a standalone basis, comparable in scale from a revenue perspective of, of where an Oracle would stand. But you look at, in terms of when I say accelerating uh, the, the, the predictions that you're making, a big part of what we do now is we create this transformation capability in creating a pathway. I want to be very clear. It's not in what it connects to on the end. That's where Oracle comes in, where we, where we create and, and we allow people to tap in and consume these set of digital capabilities that allows businesses to compete. If you think about it today, whether you're a small, medium, or large business, the digital relevancy will lead to competitiveness and ultimately in how we're going to serve our customers in a new way. What is that we're doing differently whether we're doing this at AT&T, and I want to really uh, talk a little bit about that, because that's what we're doing together with Oracle in, in terms of how we improve this journey that we're on. But if you look at it in terms of every business now and tapping into a capability, this goes down to fundamental competitiveness. And the speed with which we do this is we move into a world from building things, and my background is, is leading technology organizations, uh, and we move to a world of, of consuming and innovating on top of that, the pathways that we need and the capabilities are evolving at a new pace. And so if we think about this evolution and what we see across every business, and that is this adoption of a set of new capabilities that allows them to engage their customers in a new way and, and engage them in a digital way and meet a set of expectations that is not just something that allows us to meet a, and a bar in our industry, but deliver a best in class experience comparable to the best in class they experience as a consumer or as a business. The other important element then, if you think about this evolution that we're on, is we allow them to move with new speed and agility because the work that we do together with Oracle allows us to pre-configure and connect things in a way that lets you tap into a, a digital capability, whether that's a SaaS-based software as a service application in the cloud, or even begin moving workloads. And that's really what we're doing together. If I look at the 
work we're doing with Oracle is how do we accelerate this journey we're on? We, we've moved about 80% of our applications now into the cloud, and we've done this uh, in multiple mechanisms, but this next phase of the journey is how we go and tackle the thousands of very complex, stateful databases and now move them into the cloud environment. And that's what we're really doing together. We've moved from this transactional model into a much more strategic pathway. We've bonded the networks together, the same services that we can offer customers that allow them now just to take their secure private networks and tap them into these extended now digital services but as we work with Oracle, we're not just tapping into what exists today, we're working together to push the envelope. Frankly, if we can move databases that support the scale of an AT&T, petabytes of information, stateful information, into the Oracle cloud, as we're doing today, and solve those problems, we can solve those for large businesses, small businesses, and medium businesses alike, and we're gonna do this in a new way. It's gonna advance the autonomous capabilities. It's totally refactoring and changing the way that we even run our technology as we move to these autonomous-like features that takes people out, replaces that with embedded functionality you know, within these cloud-based services. So it's an exciting time because we've been on this journey to move you know, what sits in the back office, what sits in the front office, and something we'll probably delve a little deeper into is actually gonna change the nature of what we do. More and more, the product is software. And, and because of that, the nature of competition between industries is more porous than ever before because people have access. The competitors that are gonna be competing against companies like AT&T and others are, with a good idea can develop a software application and put it and get scale in any cloud service. But what we do together, what we do uniquely, and how we allow every business to do this with the same speed and agility, I think changes the competitiveness of the, and the dynamics of the whole industry. And just as a commercial for Thaddeus, as you listen to Thaddeus talk about the direction of AT&T business and outbound, you know, being CIO of AT&T with all of the acquisitions, mm -hmm. all of the scale, probably up there with one of the most complicated jobs in, in technology in the world. I mean, the scale, the scale of this company's data is sort of almost, I mean, 12, 13,000 Oracle databases in the company. And this, this is, you're hearing it from somebody who's lived it. I mean, this is an incredible, uh, uh, surviving those jobs and actually getting promoted. Congratulations. Those are, those are, those are difficult, difficult, difficult jobs to be able to harness all that data, all that information. I know Randall hasn't given you extremely bigger budgets along the way uh, <laughs> as you did it, so congratulations on all that. Let's talk a little bit about AT&T's mm -hmm. cloud strategy. Sure. Um, particularly, you mentioned bonding, you've mm -hmm. got a product called NetBond. Right. I mean, you've got, and I think your point, if you could touch on it, we've had customers here, I know yesterday was in a couple of meetings about, you know, we talk about raw performance in our cloud, but frankly the customer's just as concerned with the performance as it comes over the wire, mm -hmm. and what, is, that, sure. is that performing you know, packet of information coming across the wire securely, and does it perform when it gets to the end user? And maybe you could talk a little bit about your cloud strategy and the impact you can have on all that. Sure, and I think what's important, you know, having gone through the complete era of the early days where there were a lot of barriers and, and essentially we began with moving just these software-based services, consuming something that had been built and born in the cloud, to moving workloads, to now moving in this full hybrid environment of being able to interact and do this in a way that brings not just a new cost dynamic, because I think the most important piece, that's table stakes. You know, as Mark mentioned, uh, you know, for all of us, you know, the dynamics and nature of what we have to yield only continues to grow, but it's the new speed and agility that's a game changer in the industry. So if you look at what we've built together and how we're embracing, you know, we're create, we, when we do what we do right, we create this pathway that makes getting to any service in any, any public or private cloud the simplest and fastest way. But the important piece, there's new performance dynamics. We engineer our network directly in to the Oracle centers in such a way that not only can we keep that traffic as it leads your, your virtual private network or your public network all the way over into any of these centers, but we keep that, that data completely off the public internet. We encapsulate it, we move it securely. But you get another benefit beyond that 
Because if you look at it, these pre-engineered solutions, as we create this, what we call is this net bonded relationship, you get a performance improvement along the way as well, because these are pre-engineered end to end. And the beauty is, as we're adding an element of security on top of that. You embed security within each product and service, but beyond that now, you get the performance, you get the security enhancements, but you take friction out of this. At the end of the day, the ability now to follow a network transformation into a cloud transformation really allows you to follow that and move at a new pace and agility. And the important element now, as you want to tap into that next incremental service, not only can you support the workloads of the past, it's how do you now interconnect that with the workload of the future and move this and, and actually allow the competitiveness of what you can bring to bear to come to bear at a pace that we could never replicate before. And so if I think through in terms of you know, the early instantiations and generations of what we moved in these complex workloads, what did we all do? We took the easiest ones. What I'm telling you now is with what we've invested in, what we've engineered together, we are taking the most complex parts of those systems and we're moving them at scale and the beauty is we're getting not only the economies, we're getting better performance. The, as we move into a world where we've refactored this, you're getting a better performance. But it doesn't just stop with what we're doing. I'm not just talking now about the traditional you know, information technology applications. We're on a journey as a company to move our entire network into the cloud. So if you look at uh, you know, the, the nature and the core of what we do, whether it's the future wireless network, it's what we do in the physical connections, 75% of our network will be software based by 2020. We exited last year with 55% of it. This is the reality, this is the new normal. Yeah. Disruption's the new normal, but ultimately what we're doing is we're disrupting ourselves as we create this next generation of capabilities, and then we take it to step really further than that, because if you look at what we've done, the nature of how we connect businesses now, the network is actually virtual. And so what we've done is we've created a set of services that allows us now to connect an enterprise in a new way, allows Oracle to create, think about it as virtual network functions that can now sit at the edge of the network and together deliver this edge to edge intelligence. And so it doesn't stop at the core, it moves to the edge, and we're at the very early phase of the journey. So I think it's exciting about the potential of what we can lead to next. But the reality is I think the friction's gone. You know, from the early days of building private cloud to now moving to a con completely consumptive-based model, I think the new normal is if you can consume it, consume it, and ultimately put all your time and energy into innovating on top of it. Yeah. That was a great stat on the amount of uh, the network to cloud. I wish I'd predicted that uh, a couple of years ago. That would have been... You, would, would, you, you actually probably did predict it. It was probably on a different slide, and your team so failed to put it on. That's exactly I right. mean, that's as it's, I look forward here. It's the handler's fault. I did predict it. They just didn't get it on the chart. I blame your handlers. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned security. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and the handlers are telling me I'm, I'm running over time, so yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try yeah. and be, be concise. But between the two of us, we yeah. see all sorts of security threats. Mm -hmm. What's your latest view on the sophistication, number of attacks of what's going on from a security perspective today? Yeah, I think we're moving into a different era, right? I mean, I think of you know early on in our careers when we began this and what we did to, to move from predict, you know, ultimately uh, and detect and respond model is really moving to a new level because the nature of the attacks, first, trust is under attack in every industry, and frankly, everything that we've just described is increasing the digital plane. And so as trust comes under attack, I think the way we approach it has to be different because the nature of the risk now really speaks to nation state and really organized ent entities that are coming with more power than we've ever seen before. So the new dimension really relates to now how you bring and you use artificial intelligence and machine learning to elevate what you can do from a predictive capability. Yeah. Uh, that's a big part of what we do uh, at at and Business. We build, obviously, uh, security into our products and services, but we also have a managed security services offering that we've just augmented. Uh, we purchased a company called Alien Vault to move yeah. into an area called called unified security management. It's the next generation of prediction. But we embrace the ecosystem, let's be clear. It's how we tap into everything you're doing in security and everything the ecosystem is doing 
and it doesn't replace a security and event management, is how do you bring all that together in a new way? Couple that with threat intellect. Couple that with, with the data that we get in moving 200 petabytes a day through our network. What's happening in a the public domain? That's, that's a little bit of data. Yeah, a lot of stuff. You'd love to store it all, wouldn't I, you? I love but stuff. The, uh, but you look beyond that, though, and I think the next generation now in this unified security management is how do you apply and you look at what's happening across every aspect of your security to move into a model and predict, particularly for zero day and other threats of that nature, what you're missing and how do you bring insight to that? Yeah. Any last things, Thaddeus, about AT&T? We're in T&T's right. headed next. Any last yeah. messages you'd like to leave the audience? Yeah, one, one thing to close on, because I think it's important, because everything I described is to a certain degree, maybe through the rearview mirror and, and, and now slightly what we're going forward. We're at the cusp of the next generation of mobility, the advancement, the movement from 4G to 5G. And that relates to everything we're talking about today. Because we've moved into an era now where compute is delivered over the network. And the ubiquity of our networks, mobile and fixed, has grown. But now as we move into 5G, think of the next generation of network being more than speed, it's latency. There, there's some studies that have been undertaken that looks at kind of the time it takes the brain to process an image. It's about 13 milliseconds. The latency in these fifth generation networks now will be between nine and 12 milliseconds. Imagine the new real-time world that gets enabled, but it links back to the start of this conversation. So compute delivered over the network in a zero latency environment means what we'll be able to enable. Everything we're doing here gets accelerated. So I think your predictions are probably, frankly, soft again because you start yeah. looking at this next generation network. Thank and you I, very much. Thank you. The, no, I think yeah. it just shows oh, you bad. more opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. But I would just say it's, it's real. It's now. We'll be putting this in parts of 12 cities by the end of this year and launching a mobile version of 5G. But just think of what we talk about in consuming and cloud services in a real-time world and what becomes possible when this really becomes reality here over the next several years. That is, thanks so much. Very good, thanks yeah. so much, Great Mark. Great to see you again. Thank Appreciate you. it, thank you. Appreciate you doing this. All right. By the way, um, see I get criticized from all corners, it really, it's amazing. But the, if tomorrow we have a, a keynote that will have some of the most senior people in the, in the security ecosystem out there, we'll have former head of the NSA, former head of Homeland Security, uh, former leader of MI6, um, so, as you hear Thaddeus and I talk a little bit about security, you'll hear a lot about it tomorrow. I don't want to make it sound too dark, but the, the, the threats that we all are going to have to deal with are going to get, are going to get more challenging as we, go, as we go forward. So I think that'll be an interesting um, keynote to, to participate in. What time is that tomorrow? Nine o'clock tomorrow? Yeah. I think it should be quite, quite interesting. I'm not sure there's ever been a panel of this level of sophistication together uh, before at an event, so I think it'll be fun. Okay, at the risk of more criticism, I'm gonna give you more predictions, because um, this is what I do. So let's go to the first chart, and um, by 2025, and again, I, I, this could be right, I could be slow, all cloud apps will include AI. This will, again, Whatever you have in legacy applications, just to be clear, if you don't know what the application's market size is, it's $125 billion. It's likely to grow to maybe double, two and a half, three times that. Most of that is because the apps now integrate all these other technologies and AI will be integrated in all of those applications. The same will be true of blockchain. This nonsense about these are separate solutions and you're going to extract data from an application, send it some other solution that's called blockchain or some other solution that's called AI. That's not how the market's going to end. These chatbots, digital assistants, these AI machine learning algorithms will be integrated directly into the applications themselves. 100% of cloud apps will include AI. Next, uh, next chart, 85% of interactions with customers will be automated. You know, this world today where everything is done with basically people trying to gather data real time to Thaddeus' earlier point. This has to be done in something measured in milliseconds and the time needs to be spent on a more thoughtful way to engage with customers. And so 85% of interactions will now be, be automated. You won't have to deal with a who are you again? What's your number again? Where are you from? What's your problem? All of that will get automated as we move, as we move forward. Let's go to the next uh, prediction and I realize I'm a little bit 
short on time. And so let's go talk a little bit about the implication of, you know, what's going to happen out of all this. Can we, can we move ahead one more? Or maybe we are and I can't see it. There we go. 60% of the IT jobs, and I just want to be clear, um, that will be out there by 2025 haven't been invented yet. So as you, as you sit through this conference and you hear about DBAs may be disintermediated um, because autonomous database will do all of that tuning um, that typically is done today uh, manually. This is not a elimination of jobs. This is going to free up people to work on higher order tasks. So as you look at some of these things, AI changes the productivity equation. We, we've covered that with a couple of use case examples. Uh, automation addresses, basically when you automate something, not only does it get done faster, the service level, the speed goes up uh, at the same time. The service gets better while things get done faster. So the automation actually will not replace jobs, but it'll create them. So I'll give you an example. I'll take the, the second one, robot supervisor. Everybody needs a boss, um, including robots. So you're going to have to deal with now who ensures the bots are performing the way you expect them to. The bot will need a supervisor. So when you look at human to machines UX specialists, the ability for now to ensure that that experience as you deal with that user experience is right. And I'll just pick another one, AI-assisted healthcare technicians. You're going to see more and more as the Internet of Things evolves and you automate many of these healthcare devices, someone's got to ensure that there's assistance that those, those things are working properly. These jobs have not been created, and frankly, they're just beginning to be imagined, but it requires a freeing up of, of basically people to be able to apply to these jobs. So most of these jobs in IT, majority of the jobs in IT, by the time you get out to 2025, they haven't been invented yet. So this is not going to be less people in IT. I frankly believe there will actually be more people in IT, but more people in IT working on a different set of tasks. OK, why don't we go to final summary. And I did this. Believe it or not, they have a buffer amount of time for me, and I've got 55 seconds to, to close this up. First, cloud is irrefutable. It's foundational. I think if there's anything you've heard this morning is that, that this is no longer a debate. The only thing we're debating is the speed of getting this done. And I've been obviously criticized by a couple of people that I'm again too slow, which is fine. Uh, but this is, this is where the market is headed and it's, 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 it's irrefutable. Next in cloud will be the accelerated productivity innovation. This is AI and other technologies that will be integrated as features into all of these applications. Um, Frankly, as you heard yesterday, the autonomous database software, which we didn't talk as much about today, we implied a bit about it. We've never had a database offering that's had so many business outcomes associated with it. And just to recap, just to, and, and Larry touched on this a bit yesterday, but I think it's worth, although I've hit zero, uh, I'm going to roll over about 30 seconds here. Number one, when we do release a patch, and I've said this before, but I want to make sure I emphasize it. It takes about eight or nine months to roll that patch through our entire um, suite of databases out in the marketplace. Eight, nine months. So during that latency between the release of the patch and the deployment of the patch, clearly there's risk. If you don't think bad guys know about those windows, you're sadly mistaken. They know about those windows. With autonomous database, that amount of time actually goes to zero. There is no latency between the creation of the patch, the deployment of the patch. Second, while we now, with autonomous database, allow the freeing up of all of those precious DBAs onto these higher order tasks, you don't have to tune the database, optimize the database. It's done by, by, by the autonomous database itself. And never have we had the capability to provide an SLA which says service level agreement which says that you won't have any more than 30 minutes of downtime over the course of a year planned or unplanned, which you get with the autonomous database, let alone all the security, performance benefits that now OCI Gen 2 brings uh, associated with the autonomous database. So I think there's a chance for us to flip what you've got in the current IT environment, which is most of the IT budgets that 
CIOs don't like today, which are mostly maintenance, and flip those budgets into innovation. And that's the promise of, I think, everything that we're working on today. I hope you guys have a great time for the rest of Open World. Thank you so much for your attention this morning. Good luck. Bye-bye. <laughs>